this morning, got to tell you, this is one of those hard-hitting messages that James gave to the church that I'm going to try and deliver faithfully to us here. And it's found here in James chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're actually going to be seeing uh, 1 through 12, but I'm going to introduce through uh, verses 1 through 5. And it's a warning. It's a warning to those who would teach. And uh, you'll see it as we open it up. And I'm going to develop this with you, and hopefully it will make some sense to us as we go through these verses. But again, this is a warning that James is giving to those who would teach. So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5, James writes, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. So even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Speech is tremendously powerful. It can be used for good and it can be used for for evil. On the one hand, we know that words can bring tremendous joy, can even produce healing in people. We can bring words of comfort, we can bring words of hope and encouragement to those who are in pain, and and they actually, because of what we've shared with them, can take heart, can once again have hope, and can move on in life. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. In Proverbs 16, 24, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. And so words can be used to produce comfort and hope, but they can also be used to hurt. They can emotionally cripple other people. We all have used our words to hurt people, and we've all been injured by things that have been said to us or said about us. Somebody could say, I don't need you, or you're stupid, or I hate you, you're ugly, you're old, I wish you weren't born. My wife was saying that just last night, and it really hurt. You know, I I heard of of a dying man whose final words to his son were, you will never be anything. Now think about that. Your father's on his deathbed. The last thing he ever tells you, you're never going to amount to a thing. You'll never be anything. You know, there are those who who seem to enjoy saying or or hearing something bad about someone else. It's like what Proverbs 16, 27 says. An ungodly man digs up evil, and it's on his lips like a burning fire. There are people who like to hear something and then repeat it, and Proverbs points them out. Some people are experts at tearing people down using words. In Proverbs 12, 18, the writer said, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Psalm 64, 3 speaks of those who sharpen their tongue like a sword and and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words. So there are people who are expert at using words to pierce, to destroy, and to hurt. That's using speech incorrectly. The worst form of speech occurs when things are said about God that are untrue. Those who do not know him or know the Bible often speak of what they don't know, and their unbelief often undermines the faith of the young. And and that occurs quite often today in college campuses and college classes. So bad speech, it can undermine faith, but the worst kind of speech is the speech that comes out of the mouth of false teachers because the false teachers are promoting a false gospel. When you read your Bible, you're going to see, especially in the New Testament, you can point it out in the Old as well as the New, but just referencing the the New Testament, you're going to see that many times in Scripture there are warnings concerning teachers, false teachers, and and there are warnings to the people not to listen to what the false teachers are saying. Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30 says, 
Paul speaking, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, he said, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. He said, they're going to be speaking on the outside. They'll infiltrate into the inside. On the outside, they'll be speaking bad. And then on the inside, there'll be people who have been seduced by their teachings who will repeat their errors. He said, and I'm warning you elders about that. False teachers will creep in and will attempt to destroy. When Paul was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 3, he said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The time will come when people will begin to collect teachers that will appeal to their fleshly nature, say things that they want to hear. They're going to turn aside voluntarily from the things that are true, and they will yield themselves to false doctrine. That's the sign of the last days. We're living in those days, and that's happening in the church even now. In 2 Peter verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2, Peter said, there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach their destructive heresies about God and even turn against their master who bought them. Theirs will be a swift and terrible end. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of them, Christ and his true way will be slandered. And so a lot of teachers will speak things in error. There are those who speak error. There are those who speak in the name of God error. And there are teachers who are presenting themselves as, as, as teachers of the gospel, of the word of God, and they're the most dangerous of all. You see, Bible teachers have tremendous responsibility as they teach the church. Bible teachers are responsible to teach the Bible accurately and thoroughly. Bible teachers teach accurately, like it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So a Bible teacher is to teach accurately, but a Bible teacher is also to teach thoroughly. Jesus in Matthew 28.20, when he was giving the Great Commission, said that, that those who were going out and making disciples were to teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. They're to teach thoroughly from the A to the Z. In Acts 20, verse 27, Paul said it like this. He said, I haven't shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. From Genesis to Revelation, I teach you everything that God has in, 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 intended for you to know, the modern teacher could say. So James has already been warning Christians about speech. He's already told the Christian to guard their speech. In various points in chapter 1 and chapter 2, he made that clear. And what he's pointing out is that if a person claims to know the Lord, his speech will reveal whether that's true or not. Luke 6.45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. And so we guard our speech and we have to be aware of what is proceeding from within as we communicate to other people. We're to guard our speech. Now again, guarding your speech is a basic and general discipline of a Christian believer. And that's because Christians of all people understand the power of the spoken word. It's through the power of the spoken word, through preaching and teaching, that people are saved and built up in their faith. And in Romans 10, 14, Paul said it like this. He said, how then shall they call on him him in whom they have not believed, and, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? So of all people, we as believers should know the power of the spoken word, and we should also understand that the power of the spoken word has a way of bringing through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, bringing people to an awareness of their lost condition, and then encouraging them to turn to Christ and turn away from the folly that is their life. The general body of Christ is instructed to be careful with our speech. We're all instructed to be careful about the way we speak to one another. In Ephesians 4.29, Paul said, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. We have to have a careful way of approaching and speaking 
And when you do speak, you speak in love. I was sharing with a, a pastor just the other day, and we were talking about this very subject, and, and, and we were speaking of how that Paul said that we were to speak the truth in love. And that's what God has called us to do, to speak the truth, but do it in a loving way and to be accurate in the things that we're saying. Now, as a teacher, that's important. In general, that's important because with our words, we can build up and with our words, we can destroy. And we know that. A word that is unguarded, a way of speaking that is unkind has a way of driving a wedge between you and somebody else. And sometimes that wedge may never be removed because sometimes that wedge has been driven that deeply. We have to learn to be clear communicators, but we also have to learn to do so in love. So in speech, there is a responsibility, a general responsibility, but there's a special responsibility placed on the teacher of the word of God. And that's what we're looking at here in the book of James in chapter three. And we begin at verse one with his warning, where he says in James chapter three, verse one, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Men were taking it upon themselves to teach. They were taking upon themselves what has been called the sacred function of teaching the word of God. These were self-appointed teachers, but these people were not anointed and they were unqualified to teach. And the result was, Many were attempting to teach what they did not clearly comprehend. We need to know that ministry, the ministry of teaching is something that God appoints you to. The ministry of teaching is a position that God calls you to. It's not a natural ability alone. There are people who are very good at speech. They speak well. I appreciate a well-spoken person. I, I, I appreciate an articulate person, an eloquent person. I, I, I appreciate a good speech, somebody who knows how to mix facts with humor and, and knows how to drive home a point. And, and there are a lot of people who've been trained to do that. You can go to college to learn how to, how to uh, present a, uh, you know, oral presentations. And I was in, uh, in school, I, I took a class on, on uh, verbal communication and and so we had to give presentations to the class and, and the teacher, um, recorded us, uh, visually recorded us, and then critiqued the, the way that, that we spoke and all of that. And, and I appreciate it when somebody actually learns how to speak and present things properly, all of us do. But the ability to speak, the, what we used to call the gift of gab, the ability to talk is not the same as being anointed and called by God to teach. And there are people who will take upon themselves the mantle of teacher, you see it every day. You see it all the time. You see it in different ways, not just in pulpits like this, but all you need to do is follow social media. And before you know it, you've got people all the time who are writing all kinds of things about what God says. And sometimes my heart trembles as I read these things, and I'm saying, you're, you're wrong. How can you say that? This is not what the Bible teaches. And yet people just go on, on, on Facebook or whatever you name it, I don't know all of the social media now, there's so many, but you go on it and you'll see it. They'll misquote scripture, they'll put out a position, and on occasion, I, I, I will respond on occasion to a person and, and I'll, I'll bring a word of, uh, of correction on occasion because I, I think somebody needs to and nobody is. And so I, I will, just, just last week, somebody was talking about the power of testimony and, and how testimonies are so important when you tell your personal testimony and, and I said, you know, testimony is good. It's, it's a good thing. People, people it, it's fine to share what God has done in your life. I said, but over the years, I've, I've taught over 8,000 Bible studies, over 8,000 Bible studies. And in the 8,000 Bible studies I've given, I've seen many people saved, but never seen a single person saved by my testimony. Paul didn't say to Timothy, give your testimony. He said, preach the word. And that's what God has called ministers to do, is to give the word of God. But there's so many people who take it upon themselves to be pundits or to speak concerning what we ought to do and what the church should be doing and how to teach this passage and what it means. That's what James is talking about. He says again, look at verse 1, let not many of you become teachers. You're self-appointed speakers for the kingdom of God. Don't do that is what he's saying. 
You see, God has placed teachers in the body of Christ for the purpose of instructing the church. In Ephesians 4, verse 11, Paul said he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. He himself gifted the church. He himself gave some. The church has been gifted with teachers so that they could give the word of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, he said to the Thessalonians, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. You received from us. You heard the word. You're putting it into practice. These words are not how you should invest in the stock market or how you should. No, this is how you should walk, how you should please God. That's what teachers are to communicate, how to walk and please God. You see, Bible teachers have the responsibility of teaching God's word to people, and teachers are necessary, but incompetent, unqualified, and unworthy ones do much harm to the body of Christ. You see, it's God's word. And because it's God's word, we are especially, those of us who teach, we are especially subject to a stricter judgment. In Luke 12, 48, Jesus said, to whomever much is given of him." shall be much required. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, said it like this. He said, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. He's speaking of the teacher's reward. He's not saying to the teacher who's a genuine Christian that the error of his teachings, because all of us will err on occasion, he's not saying that that error is going to send him to hell. He's saying that error results in a loss of reward, which is a, a warning to, to teachers to be accurate in the things that they proclaim in the name of God. Now, many of you were not here uh, maybe almost, almost none of you were here back in 2002 when we dedicated this, this building. And prior to doing that, we, um, we actually had people come and we gave them uh, Sharpies, magic marker kinds of things. And uh, we asked them to write their favorite Bible verses here. Uh, and this entire platform from the very back door all the way up has Bible verses that people put. They all wrote scriptures. We have thousands of scriptures here, even on the floor, scriptures that were here. And uh, because I said to them, I'd like you to, to write as, as uh, from your heart, as a dedication to the Lord, the scripture that God has used in your life. And the scripture I put, I just read to you, where it says, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that, that scripture, I wrote it, it's, it's right underneath where I teach. I wrote it so that every time I stand up here, I'm standing on God's word. And I'm remembering his sure foundation. That's why we call our radio ministry a sure foundation. Because it represents that we believe that no man, no woman's life is solid without the foundation of God's word. And that's what James is reminding us and teaching us about. So let not many of you become teachers knowing you're going to receive stricter judgment. Don't just take it upon yourself to be the one who speaks about God, speaking of things you really don't know or saying things that are incorrect because ultimately that doesn't bring honor to God and it can be dangerous. You see, the message of the gospel is to be communicated faithfully. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verse 32, it reads, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. 
You see, the word of God isn't to be changed. It is not to be altered. It's to be given as it is. It's like what Paul said in Galatians 1, 8, and 9 when he said to the church of Galatia, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let them be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. That word accursed means doomed to destruction. Nothing is to be changed. It's to be given properly. And that's what James is writing about. James is saying you need to give the word of God. So don't take it upon yourself to become teachers. You shall receive a stricter judgment. And then he goes on in verse 2 to say, we all stumble in many things. If anyone doesn't stumble in word, he's a perfect man, also able also to bridle the whole body. And so we stumble in many things. Teachers have more opportunity to speak about God and his kingdom. And we have more opportunity to stumble in word. We can misrepresent God to his people. Proverbs 10, 19 says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. So because this is true, the teacher must be certain he's teaching God's word accurately. He's not to teach the latest wind of doctrine. He's not to teach the latest popular idea. He's to teach God's truth. And those who fail to teach the Bible accurately are spiritually dangerous. When necessary, they are to be identified. And believers are to avoid them. When our church was young, into several years of its history, I was the guy who would come up and I'd say, watch out for this guy. And I would name him. Watch out for this guy. Watch out for this woman. And I would name him. And when the church was small and young and the people who were coming, I knew them. They were like family. And many of them were family and friends. You know, that's what I felt the responsibility to do. So I was very quick to, to name names. Why wouldn't I? I mean, if one of my daughters was going out with a guy that, that I knew wasn't a good guy, what kind of father would I be to not tell her, I don't think you should be with this guy because I know what he's all about. He's going to hurt you. What kind of father would I be to not, you know, give his name, not, to not say, don't go out with this guy? A good father is going to be honest and say, this is the, you know, this guy, you know, honey, you really shouldn't be going out with him. You know, well, because I'm going to kill him. No, you really, you shouldn't really. So I would do that with the church. I did it not every week, not every time I opened my mouth, but often. So I would stand up and, and I would say, watch out for this teacher. And then we started getting visitors. And then after a while, the visitors started writing letters. And you shouldn't have mentioned that guy's name. It's not right. It's not Christian. And I started getting these kinds of things. So I, I stopped mentioning Joel Osteen by name. <laughs> I, I stopped naming Kenneth Copeland. I don't want to get people mad. No, I, I actually got a, a phone call when we were on K-Wave, and uh, I, I'd been teaching a passage out of the Gospel of Matthew, how that, that the, 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 uh, the hypocrites of his day, of Jesus' day, were wanting to be called Father and Rabbi, and, and how Jesus said, call no man on earth Father, don't call him Rabbi, they... They like the greetings. You know that passage, Matthew 23. And, and I shared that. And, and so I said, you know, I said, it's just wrong. I said, to take, to take a title and to try and use the title in order to garner respect is an improper way to stand and to teach. Because the respect needs to go to the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ, to the Father, to God's Word, but a man who is calling himself by a name in order for people to respect him, is, is Jesus is saying, well, it's not right to do that. I said, it's like getting a doctorate, honorary doctorate. Now, I know in this church, I don't know if any are here right now, but in this church, we have those who have earned master's and doctorate degrees, doctoral degrees and all. And a person who studies for a doctoral degree, guys, those of you who respect education and all, you know that takes years for them to do. 
to be able to work and to do all the work and, and, and to write the, their dissertation and, and to, to go under a review and, and to stand and defend your position, that takes a lot of work. You really need to know what you're talking about in order to end up with a PhD or a THD. You have to really work at that. So when someone hands you a diploma that you didn't work for and it says so-and-so PhD, and, and you run around calling yourself Dr. So-and-so, that's just not right. That's, and I was, that's basically what I said. I think most of you agree with that. That's just not right. So I was sharing that. I just said in Matthew 23, Jesus is saying, don't be running around carrying honors that you didn't earn and deserve, and you really shouldn't want those things, and that's pretty much the point I was making. And I said, for example, and I said, you know, there are those who, one per person in particular at this time years ago, I said, he calls himself by the name of Dr. I said, but I was reading an article about him, and, and he's, he's not a doctor. He didn't earn that degree. It's an honorary, that he, but yet he calls himself doctor because, because he says, this is his quote, because he said it's more therapeutic, and people like to call him doctor because it's a therapeutic title. And that's all I was saying. And, and so I said, so Dr. Schuler. so I mentioned his name. I said, he didn't, know, he, didn't earn, he didn't earn the degree, and I think it's improper for him to use that. That's true. Is there there's something mean about that? So we get a phone call. You can't be using Dr. Schuler's name because they're going to sue you. Because apparently some people representing his ministry called K-Wave. And a warning was given for me not to use names. So I started thinking, well, I, I guess I can't mention names anymore if I'm going to be litigated. So... I'm old, I don't care anymore, so, so watch out. So watch out, watch out. You know, I, you know I, 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 I still, well, you know I still do, but I just don't want you ripped off. And, and I don't say it because um, I'm jealous, because I wish I had a TV ministry, I wish, you know, because people will say that, oh, you know, you're just a nothing anyway, you're just a nothing. You know, you're, you're not a Joel Osteen. Look at Joel. He has all these services, 40,000 people who come to hear him lie to them. And, and, and for me, I have a problem with that. I really do. You know, Jesus isn't going to say to David Rosales one day, he's not going to say, well done, my good and successful servant. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear the success. I want to be faithful. And that's what James is teaching. James could have gotten in trouble. Hey, guys, don't be out there seeking a position because you know you're going to receive stricter condemnation. Oh, how unloving you are, James, to point out the fact that there are people taking upon themselves the mantle of teacher when they ought not to be doing that. Oh, how unloving. Isn't every person a teacher of the Word of God? No. Every person lives out the Word of God and by example presents what God does in a life. But there are anointed called people that are teachers who have to be careful not to take the glory upon themselves and to always teach the truth in love. And that's why James is saying there are people arising in the church being presented as teachers. He said they're taking it upon themselves. These are people who want to be regarded in a certain way that they haven't been called to. And so that's what he's saying. And then he says, if anyone, again, if anyone doesn't stumble in word, he's a perfect man. In other words, be careful and be accurate because that reveals spiritual maturity. Disciplining your speech reveals self-control because your speech reveals your heart. And if you're disciplined in your speech, your whole manner of life will also be disciplined. This actually comes under the command of being doers of the word, not hearers only. Because you live out what you say. And in doing so, you're demonstrating the truth of the words by the character that you have. And then he begins to speak concerning that. He says, uh, indeed, verse 3, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And so he brings a comparison. He speaks of, of, a, of a, a horse, and a, a horse is a living being, but he compares that, notice, with a, a ship, and a ship is not a living being. But the horse and the ship 
are examples of things that need to be controlled. They're both controlled, he's saying, by a master. And so, verse 5, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. We in California understand that. We understand that. It only takes a match to get a blaze like we're having right now up north. Just, just a spark, and it kindles. And that's the point. What, a, what an example. When we went to Rosarito yesterday, I had the opportunity of teaching at uh, Southern um, uh, Mexican uh, Pastors Conference. There were, there were uh, probably 250, 300 or more who were in t- attendance at the conference. And, and I, I have a great joy in doing that. So got up early and drove there and uh, gave a teaching and all. And, and it was wonderful. But when we got there, we were told, you know, there are fires in the area right now. And, and there are fires up north right now. And, and, uh, and what's it take? It just takes one spark, one match. It takes somebody driving a car and a chain you're hitting the asphalt and a spark hitting the side, the weed, and the weed starts. And before you know it, a small patch into thousands and thousands of acres. And that's what he's saying. It only takes a, a small, small spark to cause a tremendous, tremendous problem. A small flame can kindle dry brush, and our words can destroy people. Now, many teachers are great. They're stirring speakers, and they also stir the emotion. But the problem is, if people who are being stirred are also untaught or taught incorrectly, it actually is harmful. Human nature doesn't require too much prompting to erupt in a negative response. I mean, you have to be careful of the things that you say. You cannot go into a, into a crowded theater and yell fire. You have to be careful of the things that you say is the point that he's making. And teachers ought to be aware of this more than anything. We know that human emotion can erupt. That's why we have to be careful to teach accurately. I have heard excellent communicators as they have stirred their audiences, but as I've listened to the things they're saying, they're communicating error. I have seen some who are very theatrical. I remember one in particular that was teaching, and there were two things I was having difficulty with. One was his exposition of of the book uh, of Exodus that he was teaching from, and second was the theatrics, because one, his exposition was incorrect. The things he was saying were not biblically solid. He's well known. Thousands of people go and listen to him, but I'm listening. I'm saying, that's not what that passage says. It doesn't say that, but people love him. But then he's there laying on the, on the carpet with his, his microphone in his hand, dragging himself across the carpet as he's... And I'm watching him, and I'm thinking, interesting show. And the people are all standing and cheering because the more emotion he shows, the more emotion they have. You know this is true. The more emotion he shows, the more emotion they have. And before you know it, they're all jumping up and down, shouting as he's crawling but I'm listening to the words. And if you took what he said and put it in print form and just read it without the theatrics, you'd look at it saying, this doesn't make sense. This isn't right. But that's what you have to watch out for. Be a person who listens carefully to what's being said. Don't get caught up with the emotion. Be careful. Don't get caught up. Listen, everybody in this church knows that I have deep emotion, and it shows when I teach. I'm sorry for that, but it happens. That's me. Forgive me. But I never would want you to be stirred by an emotion. I want you to be led by the Spirit. And that's what teachers are to do, and that's what James is teaching. He's saying fires. You know, a small spark can kindle a forest fire. And verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. And so he's making it very clear that we have to be careful what we say. A true teacher needs to teach the truth of the word of God, and an unguarded tongue will inflame and destroy instead of bringing healing. Notice how he said in verse 6 that the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The word iniquity speaks of unrighteousness of heart and life. 
so an unguarded tongue destroys. The speech, the tongue, can be used to reveal as well as ignite evil passions. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, our hearts are going to be revealed for what they are. He says in verse 7, Every kind of beast and bird of, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. The fierceness of wild beasts, the swiftness of birds, the poison of serpents, the enormous strength of whales can all be controlled. But the tongue is ungovernable. There's no power in man to keep it under control. We can tame animals that are savage, but we cannot tame our own speech. Instead of bringing peace and community, we can use our speech to destroy, and the tongue reveals what's in our hearts. And we can be quick to speak and quick to get angry when we're provoked, and that's why we need a new nature and the power of the Holy Spirit to control our words, because it takes the power of the Spirit to give us self-control and patience with other people. In Galatians 5, and 23, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now learn to speak a word that is fitting for the season. Marie and I, my wife Marie and I, were newly married. Coming from different backgrounds, my background, my mom was outspoken. In my home, you just kind of said what's on your mind. I did, and I didn't get in trouble, and very open-hearted. My father used to tell me, Dave, you need to learn to keep your mouth shut. You just, you just say too much. That was my dad. My mom was very blunt, very direct. So that's my background. I come, back, I come from a place where, you want to know? I'll tell you. I'm that guy. Now, Marie, Marie's different. Marie's real quiet. And her home's very quiet. So can you imagine oil and water? She's real quiet, and I'm outspoken. So I'm figuring I'm a new, you know, I'm not a, I wasn't a, uh, I wasn't a Christian three years when I met her. I was young in the Lord. And so I'm still learning. I'm still learning to be a nice person, let alone a good man. And so I'm teaching the Bible, but I'm learning as I'm teaching. That's me. I'm a kid. I'm a kid. In the early 20s. And so we get married. And I figure, you know, truth should be told. So Marie and I were talking. We're, we're newly married. And so something's up. I would tell her, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. And she would just look at me. You understand me? I'd say, you understand? Is that clear? Because her family's quiet. She goes and sharpens her knife. <laughs> no. Her family's quiet. Mine's outspoken. Oil and water. I go outside. I come back in 40 minutes later. I got something to tell you, she'd say to me. And I'd look at her because I thought everything's been settled. You didn't say anything 40 minutes ago. What are you saying in now? You're going to reignite this, this fight that I already want? What's up with you? <laughs> I had to learn. I had to learn to listen and understand. Because communication isn't just talking. It's listening and understanding, right? And I wasn't doing that. I thought that my bold speech and clear presentation Everybody understands I'm right. Why don't you? And then she'd say, listen, mister, I've got some things to tell you. And I'd go, what? And I, so I didn't learn. Everybody in this church who knows Pastor Dave Rosales knows I love my wife. Everybody knows that. That's right. Everybody knows that. That was Marie. Everybody knows that. But not everybody knows how I got to this place. I got to this place because I had to learn how to love and how to speak. And I was 
angry at Marie over something. Again, many, many years ago, I can say it now. Many years ago. And she started to cry. And when she did, she said, that hurt me. She said it like that. That hurt me. And I looked at her and I said, good. I wanted it to. That's exactly what I did. Good. I wanted it to. She went and cried. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, don't you speak to her like that again. And I get emotional because it was real. That's my little girl. Don't talk to her like that. I've never forgotten that. Never forgotten that. He's right. I was speaking to his child the way I would never want a guy to speak to my daughter. I was speaking like that to my, my wife, but it was his baby. I learned. You guys see me now. And you think, ah, oh, it's because you're just old sentimental. No, <laughs> there's no sinner like an old sinner. If you don't repent when you're young, you become worse. You just learn how to refine your evil. People think you're nice, but you're really mean behind closed doors. But me, I said, God, I want to be your man. I, wanna, I want to learn to love and to communicate the truth in love by your spirit. Help me to do that. And I've been praying that for 40 plus years. God, help me to do that, to learn. And, and, and that we have to learn to use our tongues properly and, and, and not to use them in a way that harms and hurts. It may be clear and it may be true, but is it loving and kind? And we need to understand those things. We have to learn ways to communicate to people so that they hear your heart and not just your words. And we have to learn the language that they're speaking because sometimes my wife speaks French and I'm speaking German. We don't have a clue what's going on. But if I understand her tone and I understand the way she's speaking and the things she's saying, I may not agree with the words as they're coming out, but I know the heart that's behind them. And see, that's all Christianity. So as a Christian, I have to learn to use my tongue properly and, and not to be using it to harm people. As a husband, I have to learn to hear my wife and speak to her as a father to my children, as a pastor to my sheep. And that's what God calls us to do. And that's how it works. And it works well. And we need to remember that the tongue is ungoverned. There's no power within us to control it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And that's why we need power of God's Holy Spirit. He says in verse 9, with it we, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? A grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. We bless God with our language, but we curse men who've been made in his image. The word similitude means his likeness. Through our speech, our real faith is revealed. That's why we're careful about how we speak and what we say. He says in verse 10, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. And this, this isn't right. The same person can use the tongue for flowery speech and praise to God, but they can also destroy people with the same ease. They can be in here singing songs of worship. Oh, God, I love you. God, you're wonderful, God. And they're praising the Lord. Everything's wonderful. Then they get in the car and they start leaving the parking lot and someone cuts them off. And before you know it, <laughs> you idiot, what's wrong with you? Who taught you to drive? You can do that. With the same mouth, with the same tongue, you can praise God and curse man. And then he asks in verse 11, does a, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? A grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So we're to use our words to promote life, wholeness. Like Jesus in John 6, 63 said, the words that I speak to you are spirit, they're life. Like Proverbs 16, 24 says, pleasant words are like a honeycomb, 
sweetness to the soul and, and health to the bones. When he asks in verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs, he's pointing out false teachers. False teachers can never give truth, the truth of God's word, the pure words of life. Their words, he is saying, are filled with error. They only produce bad fruit. And so what we need to do is we need to embrace what God has said to us through his word so that we can be healed and whole and give those same kinds of words to other people. Because a genuine teacher of the word rightly divides God's word and encourages believers to receive and live it. When you read the word of God, we see what God has done. We've confessed our sins. We've received forgiveness. We're born again. We're now new creatures in Christ. We're redeemed from the kingdom of darkness. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. We become temples of the Holy Spirit. We're overcomers through the blood and the word of our testimony. We're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. And we see this in the word of God. And a true teacher will help us to see that and how it works within us. So like he said, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, which is a simple warning to make sure the things that you say about God are true. And don't misrepresent him with your words or your life.